Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security event at the Atlantic Council on Enhancing Regional Security in the Indo-Pacific, part of our Asia Security Initiative's ongoing program with the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States. I'm Barry Pavel. I'm a Senior Vice President of the Atlantic Council and Director of the Scowcroft Center, and I'm delighted to be opening today's event which will explore an extremely timely topic, how the US and its allies and partners can work with Taiwan to enhance regional security in the Indo-Pacific. As this group knows well, China's provocative military activity towards Taiwan has surged over the past year in response to these and other increasing cross-strait pressures on Taiwan. The Biden administration has been working to uh, encourage U.S. allies and partners to publicly affirm support for cross-strait stability. Uh, we had a bilateral virtual summit meeting between President Biden and Xi Jinping, uh, uh, I believe it was Monday of this week, where President Biden highlighted that, quote, the United States strongly opposes unilateral efforts to change the status quo or undermine peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, unquote. In addition, the U.S. and its allies and partners in the region are exploring options for addressing regional tensions through a variety of means, including regional frameworks such as the Quad, such as AUKUS. Uh, so today's discussion really comes at a crucial and very dynamic time and provides an important opportunity for a conversation among such great analysts as we have today to share specific actionable recommendations for policymakers on these issues. At the Scowcroft Center, we work hard to develop sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the U.S. and the world, and to honor the legacy of General Brent Scowcroft by embodying his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership and close cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. We're fortunate today to have this fantastic panel with deep expertise on U.S. defense policy, cross-strait relations, and China, and I'm eager to jump into the discussion to hear their insights. So let, let me uh, introduce uh, today's panelists. Um, we are honored to have Mr. Heino Klink, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia. During his time serving in that role, he oversaw U.S. defense policy throughout the region, uh, defense strategy development, security cooperation, contingency planning, and more. He brings more than three decades of private sector and military experience to this discussion, including eight years living and working in the region. He's currently a senior advisor to the National Bureau of Asian Research and is also the founder and principal of Clink Global LLC. I'm also thrilled, as always, to introduce Dr. Sarah Kirschberger, who is a non-resident senior fellow with the Scowcroft Center. She serves as head of Asia Pacific Strategy and Security at the Institute for Security Policy at Kiel University and is the vice president of the German Maritime Institute. Her work focuses on maritime security in the Asia Pacific region, emerging technologies in the maritime sphere, Russian-Chinese military industrial relations, China's arms industry, China's naval and space development, and much more. She is the author of a 2015 book, Assessing China's Naval Power, and she has numerous other publications too, including co-leading co a landmark publication by the Scowcroft Center earlier this year called The China Plan, which was a, a framework for how the US can cooperate with uh, European allies to help manage the rise of China. I'm also very pleased to introduce my longtime colleague, Todd Rosenblum, who's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Scowcroft Center. Uh, his work for the council has been wide ranging, emerging threats, domestic terrorism prevention, national security strategy, intelligence, cyber, non-proliferation, North Korea, and more. He was the IBM executive for national security uh, programs and strategy, acting assistant secretary for Homeland Defense at DOD, and a deputy undersecretary of intelligence at DHS, and also served on the Senate Intelligence Committee as an analyst at the CIA and the State Department. So I think uh, with so many issues to cover, um, I'll ask each of our panelists, starting with Mr. Rosenblum, to offer a few minutes of initial remarks 
on these topics, um, and then we'll dive right into a, a conversation. So Todd, over to you, and thank you again. Thank you, Barry, and thank you to the council for hosting this event. I think it's it's obviously quite timely coming on the heels of the summit, which I know we'll be talking about, uh, the Xi Biden summit. Um, and really, what I wanted to do is just spend a few minutes speaking about the context of where we are today, in, in my view, in terms of the cross strait um, really crisis period that we are in. And I don't use the word crisis all that often, but I do feel this this moment in time is elevated to that level. Just a few points I wanted to make um, about the environment today, and then talk for a bit about how China perceives the environment, how it perceives what the impact of its actions have been, uh, the mainland, and then also what the mainland thinks about the US intentions and US policy and where alliances are in terms of constructing uh, deterrence and dissuasion of, of potential escalation of the crisis. So I want to begin very quickly to talk about if we go back one decade from where we are today, we would have seen a very, very different Asia Pacific environment. Uh, China was just first beginning to um, build some artificial reef islands. Um, it was early in the period of is this going to be used for military construction? There were denials about that fact. Today, we see um, a whole range of, of military bases really built on these islands and the Spratleys and the Parcel Islands, um, on Mischief Reef, et cetera. Now where China has fighter jets, has surface to air missiles, and has really established a fairly robust defense capacity offshore. That's something that did not exist previously. Um, we've also seen a real escalation and persistence in the number of um, air and naval confrontations with US naval and aircraft, US um, uh, surface ships and aircraft, something that in the past we had seen a one-off type of event, but it's, it's more aggressive today than, than really one would have imagined a decade ago. In 2013, we saw the PRC take a really another significant step when it declared, uh, itself declared an air identification zone which expanded into actually Japanese territory. This was really somewhat of an enormous step at the time, lots of consternation about it, but it persists. Um, in 2014, the mainland um, declared a very expansive view of its fishing rights um, and, has, and has used what it called what the People's Armed Maritime Militia, which is technically a private militia directed by the government, um, to engage in a whole series of, I would say, gray zone harassing activities and also, you know, fishing, illegally fishing in other nations' waters. So I wanted to talk about that just in the sense of if you were sitting in Beijing, these steps that occurred really just over the past decade and accelerated and continue to accelerate, what has been the impact of that? What is the price that has been paid by these steps? And now I want to fast forward to this year with the PRC abrogating the basic law agreement with the British over the status of Hong Kong. And um, Beijing has ended Hong Kong's democracy. Um, for me personally, I find that very tragic and sad, but it was to many, many analysts and experts, this was a red line um, that if the mainland crossed, there would be an enormously high price to pay. Um, and there has been a price to pay, but the question is, what do those in Beijing believe to be the price that they paid? Is it, it was it higher? Um, was this cost higher than the gain? And I'm not convinced that that's the perception at all. So it leads me just to, you know, perhaps posing more questions for our discussion today, and then I'll, I'll be turning it back over. Beginning with, how is the PRC reading the U.S. today in terms of the U.S. commitment to the Taiwan's Relation Act? Um, does it believe the U.S. is firmly committed to the defense terms of this act? Um, and I, I, I pose that question, again, from the construct of sitting in Beijing. Um, what, have, what strategic actions have occurred in terms of U.S. use of of threat, coercion, uh, red lines that would not be crossed going, again, the past decade. Um, and I'm not trying to paint a, a negative picture, a fully negative picture, but if you're in Beijing, you observe the Russian interference in the US election, and you then had to assess what price did Russia pay for that? 
Russia landed, um, landed troops in Syria to the surprise and actually was in an opposing fighting force from, from a US coalition on the other side. Um, what price did it pay for that? Um, it's read of in the Trump administration, the emphasis on America first and openly questioning the value of alliances. And then most recently, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, how it was handled so chaotically from my, from my sense. Um, and, and how is all this reflecting in Beijing as it looks at the US commitment um, toward Taiwan and defense? So, and, and obviously I'm focusing on the negative. There have been a lot of positive steps that have occurred as well in terms of strengthening our alliances and partnerships. And we'll be getting to that. But I just really want to spend, you know, this in closing this time on the perception from Beijing of what price would be too high from its standpoint um, to continue to escalate the crisis in the, with Taiwan. And also, does Beijing believe that allied nations would impose that too high of a price to make it not worthwhile to it? Um, in other words, is if in fact it is gonna be largely reputational harm um, and some industrial loss, does that outweigh for Beijing um, what it views as a, as a strategic objective um, that you know, dates in its own historical perception? So I think I wanna close with just sort of those framing comments as well, Barry, and turn it back to you. Really, really helpful, Todd. You've kind of centered us, I think. I mean, when, when we think about this question, it's you know, what, what will deter China from taking, you know, the ultimate action regarding Taiwan? And to answer that question well, you know, would love to hear this group's uh, um, views on how does China perceive the situation? How does China perceive, how is China reading the U.S. generally, you know, in terms of broader strategic trajectories? And how is it, as you said, Todd, uh, reading the U.S. in terms of its commitment to the defense of Taiwan under the Taiwan Relations Act? And then, uh, you know, your other points are really good. You know, what price uh, would China think to be too high to pay? And then how do we work with, how does the U.S. and its uh, allies and partners work to try to credibly threaten that price? I think that's kind of the, the focus of the equation here for the purposes of deterrence. But there's a lot of issues. So um, let me now turn to uh, Dr. Kirschberger for uh, her general thoughts. And we'll certainly return to that great set of issues you raised, Todd. Sarah? Thank you, Barry. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I would just uh, pick off where you where you left and um, maybe maybe start with one uh, statement. I, I'm convinced that whether China tries uh, something about Taiwan or not would always depend at that moment on the risk calculus that Beijing makes. So if they are convinced at some point in time that the chances of success are very high and the risk of, of suffering a very humiliating defeat or misfortune would be very low. So that would be a risky moment in time. So from this, it follows that it's imperative that this should never happen. Uh, China should never be sure of being able to succeed. So what can we do? I think going back to the three questions that were asked basically in the, in the announcement of this event would be a good start. So how do US strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific align with Taiwan's national security strategy? I think this boils down to geography and to the security dilemma, obviously. So Taiwan has this geographic position of being like the cornerstone of the first island chain. And if you look at the maritime geography in particular, you will see that the first island chain is something that fences China in naturally. So that is just an accident, you could say, of geography. From China's point of view, very unfortunate situation. So if you read what uh, Chinese strategists write about Taiwan and the first island chain, they, they ask the government to push for pushing the security parameter outward to the, towards the east of Taiwan. So there's lots of arguments floating around that Taiwan is this unsinkable aircraft carrier and, and its presence is threatening the security of the population centers on the Chinese eastern coast and so on. And of course, also the, the fact that China aims to have 
a secure area for its, uh, ultimately for its ballistic missile submarines in the South China Sea, but preferably even having them able to, you know, transit towards the open Pacific for which Taiwan would be like the springboard. So that's the one side. And the other side is of course, all the allies of the United States on the first island chain, Japan, but also the Philippines and so on that do not exactly share the Chinese view of things and that are very, you know, um, dependent on, on American support. So America has, has basically its own interest in keeping and maintaining that situation. And actually that's a very old notion. So Brzezinski, the old um, security advisor in his book in, in 1997, the Grand Chessboard basically said that it doesn't really, it's not really about this island of Taiwan. America has to help if they cannot defend themselves for its for America's sake, for its for the for reason of maintaining its its own geopolitical interests in the Western Pacific. But of course, the Chinese would prefer for the Americans to withdraw. So that's the one aspect of this. And the foreign minister of Taiwan, Joseph Wu, has called Taiwan a sea fortress basically out emphasizing the value that the Taiwan has as playing its part in this um, containment effort of containing China's uh, naval expansion, maritime expansion. So the question is, what um, can be done? What can be done to, um, to keep China from escalating things beyond a point where, where you know, uh, a crisis is almost unavoidable? And as I said, I think this is about influencing risk perception, risk calculus. So um, China is, is heavily engaged in pushing narratives, basically gaslighting the world about the reality of what Taiwan even is, making it sound like this is purely an internal Chinese affair and so on. We even have Western analysts, even American analysts arguing uh, one should just hand Taiwan over to China to keep the peace. That would be like a good solution. The, the one thing that all these narratives do is they are denying agency to the Taiwanese themselves as if they didn't play a role in their own, you know, in their own history, in their own fate. So that's something we should always avoid. We should always ask first, what's in the interest of Taiwan? So avoid making Taiwan something like a bargain chip or also avoid by doing something drastic that may seem the right thing to do, but is not actually in Taiwan's interest. Upsetting the apple cart in a way that is not constructive. There's a, a risk of that happening. So what we should do is we should counter all these attempts, these probing strategies that China uses to alter the status quo. So we need to be extremely vigilant. We need to signal constantly to China, we're looking at you, we're looking at what you're doing, we're noticing it, we're not, not on board with it at all. And if it is necessary, we will, we will push back. AUKUS is a fantastic signal in my view. AUKUS is exactly what was needed to show China that it has gone overboard, pushed the envelope too far, and now has actually made an enemy of Australia, which was very much on the fence about China just a couple of years ago. And this is a result that China cannot really be happy about. I think this should give Chinese strategists something to think about how Australia came to make this spectacular decision really. So what could Europeans do? Of course, one thing that's very important, the best deterrent against anything drastic coming from China would be Taiwan's uh, ability to defend itself. So this should be also in the focus of everything we do. How can Taiwan be strengthened? I personally like the idea of tripwires. So I think this um, training effort that the US military is doing on Taiwan is fantastic in terms of being a tripwire, uh, uh, providing this function of a tripwire force. And also Europeans could think about something like a rotating naval presence there. It could be very small. It could be just one ship at a time from some nation or other, but one ship should always be there in that region. So that's something I personally would think would give a good signal. It wouldn't be very offensive, very drastic, but it would definitely make a statement and also have something like a tripwire function. So, and, and the last thing that I could think of is we should not over fulfill this one China policy. 
we are probably all going to keep it, including the United States. But there's lots of le different levels of how strictly one can interpret it. And we should not proactively limit ourselves in what we do with Taiwan, but rather go to the limit of what the One China policy allows for. That's my remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And really, really helpful framing also about how uh, US interests align. Uh, about how we change the Chinese risk calculus, which I want to get back into um, Europe's role and Taiwan's ability to defend itself. And I also want to think about and talk about other other grouping. So AUKUS to me was step one sort of of various kind of coalitions or groupings. You know, what else should we be thinking of that involves Indo-Pacific allies and partners, European allies and partners? But before we get there, I want to turn to our third uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Klink, so please uh, welcome your remarks. Thanks, Barry, and thank you to the Atlantic Council for including me in this great discussion. Uh, I'll tell you, I spent almost 30 years in the Army, so I was able to do a lot of things, but I never got a PhD or any kind of doctorate degree, so, but thank you, Barry, uh, nonetheless. Um, so uh, thank you also to my colleagues, Todd and Sarah, for really setting the stage for a wonderful discussion. I'll tell you, there's so much ground to cover. Um, and I will tell you, you know, based on my own personal experience, having served at the U.S. Embassy in the early uh, 2000s and reporting on a lot of the things that are now common knowledge and almost daily uh, uh, include daily media coverage on. You know, we had about two decades where the United States was distracted strategically based on our commitments in Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, hindsight is always 2020, but I think history will certainly show that this created a window of opportunity that uh, China exploited uh, to the maximum of its ability and capabilities. And we are now playing catch up. In those intervening years, there are also two other things that really changed that got us to where we are today. One is a new paramount leader of the CCP and of China, Xi Jinping, uh, just recently, in essence, uh, elevated to the same level as Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping at the sixth plenum. I think it was last week. And under his leadership, um, Deng Xiaoping's famous 24 character maxim that basically translated into keep a low profile bide your time, hide your capabilities, that was completely jettisoned. And uh, China, under the leadership of Xi Jinping, has been arrogant, assertive, and aggressive, not just vis-a-vis -vis the United States or Taiwan, but just about every corner of the world has found the ire of China through economic coercion, military intimidation, and other means. Another thing that has changed quite significantly is the U.S. position on China and how it views China transparently and very overtly. The, the national security strategy of 2017 called out China and Russia, of course, as well, as strategic competitors and, in essence, uh, brought us into, at least publicly, uh, the, the era of great power competition. Then the national defense strategy of 2018 doubled down on that even further. I think that these were monumental documents because they shifted American focus very, very publicly on a generational challenge that uh, China poses to the United States. And frankly, I wish that would have happened maybe 5, 10, 15 years earlier. But the fact that it did occur and it has now marshaled the resources of the United States, as well as its partners and allies, to start the process of confronting China where we must, um, has served a tremendous purpose and as organizing principles, again, for the United States and its partners and allies worldwide. It obviously remains to be seen uh, what the Biden administration's national security strategy will say. Uh, and all of us here within the Beltway in Washington, I think, are awaiting anxiously the publication of that document. I, for one, would say that uh, I do not anticipate that there's going to be much strategic difference 
from what was uh, included in those seminal documents uh, from the Trump administration, because the challenge is indisputably the same. And re regardless of what side of the aisle you're on in Washington, uh, the views of China, the China challenge is the same as well. And I would say as well that I align myself 100% with Dr. Kechbega that complicating the Chinese calculus is what it's all about. Whereas I do believe that the PLA uh, will go, if you will, if there is a declaration of Taiwan independence. Uh, anything short of that, I think, uh, will be very, very conditional and conditional based on, again, whether or not the PLA is thinks that it can do it and be successful because the risk of failure is tremendous, especially when you have someone such as Xi Jinping at the helm of the CCP and at the helm of China. So um, I welcome the opportunity to do a little deeper dive on some of these points. So I'll leave it at that for now. Well, thank you, uh, Heino, um, Mr. Klink, um, uh, and your, all of your, um, all three panelists really helped to build this picture. And so I want to kind of go back to the basics uh, that were raised, you know, if we're trying to think about ways to deter a Chinese takeover, you need to think first about how does China see things? And so would love uh, all of your thoughts on sort of number one, how does China see the broader strategic picture about the relative trajectory of the United States? You know, do they see the U.S. as steady or not? Um, and how, how do they see themselves? Um, I think uh, Todd raised some good issues about them not paying a price for a lot of um, activity that was uh, clearly uh, hostile to many parties. And so there might have been a general kind of weakening of deterrence in general. So we just love your thoughts, first of all, on Xi Jinping, uh, who really is the decision maker. And he seems different than his predecessors, not just in the title, but in other ways. So I want to throw that out there uh, to uh, all of you for your thoughts. First of all, how does China see the situation? I'll get started then. Um, China views the United States as being in decline. That's not a new narrative. That is a narrative that has been uh, basically present since two, the 2008 financial crisis. The Chinese have also viewed us historically as a paper tiger. They viewed uh, America's effort at deterrence with, uh, with quite a bit of disdain. And that goes back even to um, the Korean War. Most recently, uh, the Afghanistan pullout debacle was fodder for the CCP's propaganda, not just for its own domestic audience, but also internationally and international messaging, particularly towards Taiwan and our allies in the Indo-Pacific, st stating that the United States cannot be counted on. I believe historically the Chinese have never quite gotten a firm grip on how to view the United States and have not figured out yet, to be perfectly honest, that there are certain issues that the Americans will in fact push back on. And, you know, despite the fact that I, th I think, uh, again, our uh, commitment in the Middle East and Central Asia uh, may have gone on for too long and at too high of a, of a price, um, it is an example of the U.S. committing when its interests are at stake. And again, the, 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 the Chinese have not always read us correctly in that regard. More importantly, frankly, um, the, the Chinese, I think, have misplayed their upper hand uh, that they've had in, in terms of public diplomacy over the years. I mean, Todd uh, raised the Hong Kong issue, which I think was... Uh, a galvanizing event. But let's not also forget what's happened since Hong Kong, COVID. Uh, I'm certainly not a conspiracy theorist, but any way you slice it, COVID was made in China. Whether it was in a lab or in a cave, you know, it came out of China. And frankly, I think it's common knowledge that the Chinese certainly did not uh, take the same type of actions to contain it within its borders as they did with, I should say, within its international borders uh, to the same level as they did within their own municipal and provincial borders, coupled with the fact that they weaponized PPE and used uh, their vaccines also as potential coercive tools. All these things 
have galvanized the international community to kind of view what China has tried to portray themselves as being on the on the ascendancy vis-a-vis a decline in the United States have called that into question. Thank you, Sarah. Todd? Yeah, should I maybe add to that? I fully agree with uh, what Heino Klink just said, but um, to add maybe, I, I think that we need to look also a little bit into who advises Xi Jinping. So there's, there's uh, some difficulty there. So the Chinese top leadership is a bit of a black box to analysts, but we do know that Wang Huning is like the chief advisor and there's been uh, a little bit of news reporting on his thoughts and the development of his thinking recently and it's pretty well known that he was in america that he has first-hand experience of america but that he got completely dis disillusioned um, about the system basically that he saw and and that was maybe partly responsible for uh, developing this um, notion that China could present something like an alternative model of development or something. But when I look at the behavior of the current government in China, to me, all this hypersensitivity to criticism that is evident there does not exactly speak of confidence of self confidence. So they are, are so, basically, if, if it were a person, one would say they're behaving like a narcissist completely unable to take any sort of feedback, even mild criticism, and lashing out uh, violently against anyone, uh, putting forth some sort of, you know, even constructive criticism, being completely aggressive, at the same time uh, using a victim narrative, basically to turn around the blame. So, so this is a pattern of behavior that normally indicates a lack of self-confidence and not the opposite. So if you look at the domestic development of China, and that is really something that we should focus on, there's two things. One thing is China does have a, a huge pile of problems to solve over time that are not going to be easy to solve. And the government is probably very well aware also of dissent even within the party. There's uh, been a, a lot of, you know, recently jailings of high level officials, for instance, in the domestic security system, um, rumors of defectors, some actual defections that we know of people who, who went abroad and are now criticizing Xi Jinping very openly. So there's a lot of, you know, people who do not agree with the current approach of the government and also this uh, huge purge of officials that Xi Jinping has been conducting basically since 2012 when he came into office has probably also generated a lot of hatred and resentment among those who were affected because each of these purged officials basically has, has a lot of cronies um, that depend on them. And so this is, this is a large uh, sizable, you know, uh, portion probably of the former power structure that he has made enemies of. And the other thing is uh, some developments are just like demographics, something that you cannot really influence whether it's pollution, climate change, or demographics, these are trends that are not really, you know, easy to influence. And looking at the timeline that, that the Chinese government is probably looking at, we can infer that this decade is from 2021 now to 2030. This is probably, as it has been called, the decade of concern, because then China can still feel probably that it has the upper hand in some ways. But after 2030, there's a real risk the China could be facing a middle income trap, could be faced with very, very unfavorable demographics and could be facing a host of problems, whereas the United States might have recovered by that time and stopped being a declining power in the Chinese perception. So there, this is what I, I think we need to take away from this. We need to, to see the pressures that the Chinese government is probably facing internally also, and also realize that it, it is what we have to do now. We have to get our part of this interaction right during this decade. So we need to make sure that this maybe desperation to, to solve the Taiwan issue in this decade, that this, this does not bear fruit. And if we can, can basically hold the line until 2030, I would think, looking at it now, that, that this, then the tide will have turned, perhaps. Thank you, Sarah. Todd? Yeah. I want to associate myself with comments from Heino and from Sarah, and, and I agree with much of them. I take a slightly different 
view of things. And one, it, it takes me back to my own time in the mid 1990s when I was among the many who thought Chinese entrance into the World Trade Organization would inevitably lead to a democratization because it could not get on top of corruption um, unless it have a, had an open civil society. Um, I was obviously wrong about that judgment. Um, I've, my, my view today, having said I was very wrong in the past, is that in fact, China, the, the mainland clearly views itself as on the ascendancy. Um, that is in a period of extraordinarily nationalism, extraordinary um, fomented, promoted nationalism by the state, which is actually quite dangerous, I think, as well, in terms of putting pressure to keep doing acts and making statements that keep the nationalist sentiment going forward. Um, and also in terms of, you know, the leadership losing control of that nationalist narrative. We see little tidbits of this about Maoist groups who demand more purity from government, that sort of thing. But I, I don't view that as a threat in any way. I think, you know, she has curly ensconced himself, as you mentioned, uh, with Mao and Deng uh, as, you know, um, leaders above all else in the nation. Um, now, having said this, I do think, and earlier we, I raised this issue, and we've all talked about the reputational, um, can, does reputational harm deter Beijing? And certainly in the near term, um, it will, you know, as it hosts the Olympics, I could not imagine action by the mainland before the Olympics, because there would be a, you know, almost a total global boycott, other than the Russians probably showing up um, for, the, for the games in, in the mainland. Uh, but that's a near term issue. And I also think just going back on perception, I suspect that in Beijing, they're looking at the US um, for steps that have been taken that I certainly support, which is more normalization of relations with Taipei. The increasing, and, and this is within Sarah's point about things we could do while still staying in the parameters of the Taiwan Relations Act, um, receiving high level delegations officially, um, openly doing training exercises. These I think are very effective measures that we um, can and should be doing to help hold that line. At the same time, if you're in Beijing, you have to wonder if the US in its perception is in a decline now, um, yet it still sees the US building new alliances that are quite substantial, as you mentioned with Australia and UK. Um, and the US is also pushing for, for more normalizing relations with Taipei. Is there a time clock that it believes it has that it must act and sort of force the hand on this issue. So I certainly concur very strongly that holding the line in this period is essential because I do think this tension, um, we're entering a period of more tension, less tension, um, and that we will be there for a bit of time. Uh, just one other comment I wanted to throw in, it was, um, and it's, it's uh, commenting on what was reported in the media about uh, war gaming by the US military. Um, in terms of the defense of, of Taiwan, and that there was a lot of consternation at the end of the war game in terms of um, how, how long um, Taiwanese defense would hold up and what the um, price and speed uh, and, and, and use of force by the US this would take. Um, so this is reported in, in, in media all across the U.S. And I do think, obviously, the PLA and leadership in Beijing reads those same reports as we do. Um, and that is also fitting into their calculus in terms of, is there a go period? I don't think this is something that will be left to the PLA to decide it's a go period. But I do think it adds to the perception that there is a moment in time, and this decade is that moment in time. Really, really helpful uh, all. And I just want to dwell on this issue a little bit. And so it just strikes me that, but I, I would love to hear your thoughts. I mean, is, is Xi Jinping a, a less risk averse Chinese leader than we've seen in a very long time? Is he more risk prone? Uh, and at number one and number two, is it what what is driving that? Um, is it his own ambition? Is, do we think he has a sense of the, the massiveness of the problems before him? Uh, Sarah mentioned a few of them, didn't even mention yet, but the, I mean, the economic issues are starting to loom larger. I, 
had a discussion with um, um, a banking official today, and they said, you know, this is just one view, but they said, you know, we may be facing, you know, peak China. China may now have a sense that its economy is not going to grow forever. It's got debt problems, real estate problems, environmental problems. There is a long list that this official uh, corporate debt, uh, this official raised. So is that partly what's driving Xi Jinping? And then the last sort of piece for this uh, discussion right here is um, you, you guys talk timetables. So not before the Olympics. What about before uh, the, the party, the 20th Party Congress in November of 2022? Are we okay before then? I'm not, it's, it's little solace, but um, you know, this timing and urgency question, I think, is also very relevant. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on those issues. So I would offer that, on the one hand, I do believe that Xi Jinping is less risk averse and perhaps more risk tolerant than some of his predecessors. But I think also um, he has miscalculated, and this goes to Sarah's point of the, the criticism uh, that he's now facing, although I would say that's probably a very dangerous act to become a part of if you're in China, because uh, uh, because of the, the, the history of purges within the CCP uh, of, uh, of, of, of opposition and potential opposition to Xi. But I think it has come as a surprise to the, the leadership uh, of the international pushback just within the last 12 months, quite frankly. If you look at, for instance, uh, within the last 10 months, and you know, let's not talk about Australia because that's pretty obvious. Japan, uh, the Japanese rhetoric with respect to pushing back on Chinese assertiveness, as well as highlighting the fact that more and more that there is a realization in Tokyo that the defense of Taiwan equals the defense of Japan. The fact that now the Japanese are discussing very openly uh, breaking through the self-imposed uh, policy cap of 1% of GDP being spent on defense, which has been in place uh, for forever. Um, and the movement of Japanese forces to the Southwest Island chains. All these things have been occurring uh, publicly, frankly, within the last uh, 10 months or so. You see, obviously, pushback in Europe as well. And even the South Koreans, when President Moon uh, visited the White House, even in, the, in the, uh, the joint communique between the United States and South Korea that was published, the fact that the South Koreans agreed to mention peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait, that is unprecedented. And that shows that uh, she has, in fact, miscalculated. Now, that being said, I go back to my uh, earlier point, which I think will always be relevant, regardless of an Olympics, regardless of a party Congress. If Taiwan declares independence, the Chinese will be forced to act. And I think there's a lot of, you know, in this town in Washington here, there's a lot of talk right now about the, the continued value of strategic ambiguity. Should we be more clear as to what we would do? You know, I personally believe there's a lot of things that we can still do and are doing, quite frankly, and have been doing uh, that enhance deterrence, enhance Taiwan's self-defense capabilities in accordance with the Taiwan Relations Act that do not gratuitously provoke China. And, and frankly, I spent a lot of time when I was in the Pentagon uh, in my most recent uh, uh, job there working on that. And I think those things can be done in a no profile manner and in a low profile manner, which to be quite frank, the Chinese will always find out. But if you do things in a way that do not unnecessarily provoke them, I think that's actually more effective than doing some sort of public uh, training event exercise and the like. Should I go next perhaps? Okay. 
about Taiwan declaring independence. I would just like to throw it out there that as far as I understand, uh, the official position in Taiwan is that there's no need to declare independence because the Republic of China on Taiwan is an independent country and has been one uh, basically since 1911. So um, that's the official position. So I, I actually think this is not a likely event that we're talking Good. about. Taiwan, <laughs> Yeah, I actually, why would they do this? This would be like suicide. I, I don't know anyone in Taiwan who would go down that road, except maybe a very, very fringe minority of people who are reckless. But the absolute majority of Taiwanese do not want, of course, a war, and they will not give China a reason to start a war. So I, I think that is not, not what we should be worrying about. What we should be worrying about is China defining ever more um, red lines that are ultimately unfulfillable, like like recently making it illegal to uh, to I'm not sure they they made it illegal to to strengthen Taiwan independence. So basically, people like Foreign Minister Joseph Wu are now at threat of being criminalized for for doing their jobs. Um, but back to the question whether he is more risk prone than his predecessors. I fully agree he is definitely more risk prone. He's taken pretty big risks already. But I would argue he's not doing that because he's so brave. I think he has no choice. So I remember in 2012, he actually visited Berlin and I was at that event and he looked so tired and worn out. And only later did it become published, public knowledge that he'd been through a very, very bad leadership crisis with the Bo Xilai, um, almost like a coup attempt, you could call it. So she himself seems to have said later at, at, an, at an internal speech that the party stood at the brink of destruction in 2012. And we know that there was a huge purge. People who were on the Politburo ended up being jailed for life. So it was almost an event like 1967 after the death of Mao Zedong and the Gang of Four type thing. So um, he came to power against that backdrop. And he's totally dependent on the PLA protecting him. So the PLA is the armed wing of the Communist Party and its, it's, its rationale for existing is to protect the rule of the party. And she is ultimately dependent on their support. And I think part of his aggression, outward aggression or his belligerence is driven by this need to sort of keep on the good, good side of the hardliners in the PLA and basically cater to the mood of the nationalists in the PLA. So I think these are some of the reasons why, why external aggression and nationalism are, are such powerful tools for him, because he gets the support of, of these hardliners in the PLA and he can rally support in the populace. It was very obvious during the, she, uh, during the Bo Xilai affair when Bo Xilai stood trial at the same time, there were huge anti-Japanese protests in China because of the Senkaku issue. And they were actually fueled purposefully. One can show that, that the Chinese government has, has used this as a tool to distract the public opinion away from this embarrassing trial against Bo Xilai and direct it towards nationalist outrage against the Japanese. So this is something we should also keep in mind. And my question is, if Xi Jinping is such a powerful leader and so confident that time is on his side and he's everything under control, why hasn't he left the country in such a long time? And my personal guess is he doesn't dare leave the country and not because he's so afraid to catch COVID, but I think because of a history in the past and past leaders going on foreign trips and when they return finding out that they have been ousted from power. So I'm just putting that out there as a possibility. Of course, I'm not, not a thought reader and not Xi Jinping's personal advisor, but I'm very struck by his reluctance to leave the post, even though it's beginning to be questioned more and more. And this is one further, I think, indicator that he may be risk prone, but it's probably not driven from being a brave leader. It's, it's, it's a haunted leader. It's someone who feels that he is really under threat from the various constituencies. I, I think that's very well said. I would only add a couple brief remarks to it that um, I do believe um, that his consolidated power is quite strong. 
Um, and in fact, his ability to now go after industrial leaders, industry leaders, especially in the tech sector, um, parallels very much uh, Putin's Russian kind of approach to things where um, it is clear who is controlling the levers of state and power and that no, no entities or no groups shall become powerful enough to, to challenge, um, keeping the PLA issue somewhat as a, as a separate one. Um, but I think his internal control um, politically is, is quite strong. Um, it, but I will not even venture a guess. Are we safe? Is, is Taiwan safe until the next party Congress? Um, I've already let you know about my ability to correctly call things regarding mainland issues earlier. So I'll, I'll take a pass. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Let but me, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> let me posit, um, we, we try to use foresight and strategy uh, as much as we can in the Scowcroft Center. Let me posit two scenarios of a, a 2030 or 2035 China and get your thoughts. Because um, we've been looking at some scenarios in the Scowcroft Center. Uh, we've been discussing economic trends, as I mentioned earlier um, in this discussion. One, one trajectory is China continues the sort of uh, really significant growth, uh, you know, meeting most mainstream uh, economists' expectations that its economy will continue to be strong, not without problems, but, it, you know, its GDP uh, will ultimately surpass that of the United States. Uh, 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 and, you know, it'll, it'll have a strong economy despite some of the problems I've mentioned. And, and, and how does that affect um, the leadership's calculus? But then the other one that I'm getting more concerned about is what if some of these uh, economic problems prove structural and, and, that, and the ability of Chinese economic policymakers to manage them is not as effective as it has been? So what if China's growth either slows very significantly uh, from what it has been, uh, and certainly we're seeing some projections, it's not going to be anywhere close to, uh, you know, in terms of the next several years to what it has been. But what, what if it really starts to hit some bumpy economic um, um, uh, areas? And so it's, it's maybe not a declining China, but a China with real economic, um, you know, uh, stalling, and, and how does that play out in terms of Xi Jinping's calculus? So which, which, it's almost like which, not that we have a choice, but as we're watching, you know, over the next several months and years, China's economy play out, we see it heading more in one direction or another, which is more difficult and challenging for the United States and its allies, which would make it go, um, you know, take risks regarding Taiwan more? Is it the strong China that feels very confident? Or is it the relatively uh, weaker China that's 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 hitting some uh, significant economic challenges domestically? Um, maybe I'll, I'll go first this time on this. I think these are a great set of questions you're asking. First, I'll go back to my mirror imaging exercise. If you're looking at um, which great power economy has um, deficit and debt far beyond what the eye could see and which great power economy has surpluses far beyond the eye could see. Um, I, I think, you know, while in my view, China faces an enormous number, number of hurdles economically, um, socially, and in terms of a, a lot of social welfare policies, et cetera, which cost money, but it has the resources to deal with them. And I think it has proven actually over and over again that it is capable of putting money toward problems. Um, so I'm a little bit softer on the, the, the significant concern about China's economy 2030 than others are. Two quick thoughts and then I'll, I'll sort of yield back. Um, one is to your, your last question of, is an insecure nation more likely to lash out than a secure one? And I think the answer is an insecure nation is far more likely to lash out. Um, and again, as we've talked about before, the we have a say in whether this nation feels secure or insecure, um, and whether we have a predictable international environment or an unpredictable international environment. And so there's much within our, our sort of power to raise the level of predictability 
um, and raise the effectiveness of our signaling. So in fact, you know, as a state, it would be more secure knowing it had that predictability. Second point is, you know, I know I've been mirror imaging saying don't discount Chinese um, ability to, you know, weather some of these things. The one thing I believe very, very firmly about the United States is it has an extraordinary power of, um, of, of remaking and innovation. Um, and so while the U.S. is in a period it is right now, if we're talking 2030, I'm pretty confident the U.S. will have figured out um, in what is today's version of the social contract and, and, and government's role in economics that it will be a, the U.S. will have um, adjusted course once again. And um, the decline scenarios, I don't think are quite going to play out that way. I know. What are your thoughts on the these, these two Chinas? Sure. So um, I will say that number one, there have been many examples of China in Chinese history where the central government, whether it was led by a communist regime or an imperial regime, uh, used a external threat to focus uh, domestic uh, support for something else. So, um, so there is certainly, if there are internal issues, domestic uh, strife driven by a slowing economy, uh, that yes, you could envision scenarios where a China uh, might lash out in order to uh, attract attention or put attention elsewhere. I would say though that, again, a Taiwan scenario would be pretty extreme. And I would say that with all the challenges that have already been enumerated by my colleagues uh, that China is facing, you know, I don't think that Xi Jinping wants a war uh, because the cost of it would be overwhelming. And despite the fact that we know now that in 1989, when uh, Deng Xiaoping decided to clear Tiananmen Square with the PLA and that there was an actual risk calculus that that uh, informed that decision and that the, the Chinese leadership was under, you know, had calculated that I think it was for a decade, they would face economic sanctions and that they would take an economic hit. You know, history showed in that example, I think it was less than a year that, if I'm not mistaken, it was actually General Scowcroft went to Beijing to meet with the Chinese leadership. I'm confident that the Chinese leadership is doing the same types of calculus if they did have to move against Taiwan. Um, but again, fundamentally, they want to avoid having to do that as well. And I think fundamentally in, ter in economic terms, I think we are starting to see some initial trends where companies, not just in the United States, but in Asia, and I would say even in, in Europe, are looking at diversifying their supply chains to be able to insulate themselves from uh, Chinese economic coercion. I think there are also companies that are looking at uh, growing their markets elsewhere so that, the, that they're not dependent on just exporting to China. I think these are things that you're going to see more and more, and that will actually lead to additional economic pressure on, on China. And I would tell you from a very, you know, a very fundamental uh, point, you know, I, I certainly do not want to see a China in turmoil either, but a China that has to make the same types of decisions about how much to put towards defense as, as, as we, for instance, the United States debate, I think that is something that is in our interest. That were really excellent remarks, and I, I basically agree with, with what Todd Rosenblum said. Of course, uh, the insecure China is more likely to do desperate things, and the stable China is probably not going to try and upset the apple cart too much because of the risks. I would just like to add, we have maybe also ways to influence that risk calculus in, in yet another way. Uh, one thing I've been thinking about for some time would be a very interesting research project, trying to put a number of what that, for instance, that naval buildup has cost the Chinese national economy 
So I've just looked at, you mentioned, kindly mentioned my old book, Barry, 2015. I, I, I took it out of the bookstall and looked at my projections from 2015, which were based on what open source analysts, for instance, from Jane's thought was a likely trajectory of development. And I looked at all the ship classes, what growth was projected in 2014, 2015. Looking back at it now, six years later, growth across the surface ship classes was actually 100% larger than was thought a likely, likely trajectory in 2015. So the growth has been almost exponential in that way, right? 100% more than, than what was thought likely. And looking at it from the perspective of someone who knows what naval systems cost in terms, not just procurement, but manning and maintenance and fuel and operating them and repairing them and so on, over a life cycle, the procurement cost is a tiny fraction of the total cost. So if you look at this huge fleet, what does this represent in terms of a share of what the government expenditure is? And if one put out more studies of this type, they would find their way into China as well. And so people in China might begin to you know, ask questions, why is so much money put into this and not addressing other pressing issues? be it social security or other you know, regional disparities and so on. So we could actually try and make this more transparent because that is ultimately the strength of democracies, not just the ability to reinvent themselves and purge themselves of bad things, also transparency and really putting ideas out there. Whereas in China, another indicator for the insecurity of China is this clamping down on dissent and re reduction of the space for open discourse. Ten years ago, you could have co totally different discussions with Chinese colleagues. Nowadays, you invite Chinese colleagues to panels. If they come at all, they only read from script and do not dare deviate from anything that is like dictated almost to them, in many cases at least. It's very, really sad. And, and this is another indication of this insecurity that we are seeing. So we should use the ability of, of you know, free societies to put accurate information out there. And, and I, I'm sure that would have an effect on those people in China that hope for more freedom of thought. And they do exist. We should not you know, by the narrative that is put out there by Xi Jinping's government that every single uh, member of the Communist Party is completely happy and on board with what, with what is happening in China. I do not think that is the case. And that is only the party. We have a whole, you know, population to think of. And uh, whether it's private entrepreneurs or, or people in the universities, not everyone is happy with the direction that China is taking. And without being in any way aggressive or, you know, promoting regime change or whatnot, we can just put our, you know, alternative knowledge out there and hope, you know, to inspire some people inside China to take things maybe to a different level once Xi Jinping and his government are phased out. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's a great point. Uh, China seems to... Um you know, conduct, conduct its own uh, information operations, or as you said earlier, you know, has a, a pushing its narratives uh, about a number of issues. And uh, I just feel like the democratic world doesn't quite do that. <laughs> and we have strengths that should lend themselves to being able to do that, do that rather effectively. Um, and we didn't even talk yet about the Chinese nuclear buildup, the hypersonic weapons test, um, which I think plays into this near-term deterrence equation, deterrence in the 2020s at least. You know, why uh, did China, uh, why is China embarking on that buildup? I, a, a lot of analysts think it has a lot to do with Taiwan and, and dissuading the United States from thinking that it can have an, an advantage. So we should, we should talk about that. But I do want to kind of start to zero in, Sarah, on the issues that you raised earlier. You know, what is what are the key elements of the deterrent? You mentioned a tripwire, which I think is, you know, useful but not sufficient. Are there other things the U.S. military should be doing to close any gaps? Taiwan increasing its defenses. I'm really curious about the roles of other countries in the Indo-Pacific, and also in Europe. And when I think about Europe, also, um, and would love to hear views on, you know, how Europe is evolving which I think is, is true. 
but there's also diplomatic power that can be brought to bear by Europe, and there's economic power that could really be brought to bear, but that's tough, I know. That's one of the tougher areas, but to me, what sends a, a, a bigger signal uh, to China to back off, you know, a, a, I'm just making it up, a German frigate, one German frigate going to the Indo-Pacific, or um, two countries in Europe um, saying in a diplomatic statement, if China uh, took over Taiwan, then trade relations would be put on hold or no more Chinese investment or some kind of economic tool that I think, to me, that 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 is potentially uh, more relevant than um, a small deployment of military capabilities. But I, th I threw all this out here because I want to really zero in before we turn to the questions from the audience pretty soon. I want to really zero in on what does a, an effective deterrent look like if we don't think we have one today across those actors? So I'm happy to address the military component that uh, because I spent some time on that uh, when I was in office. Um, so I think first and foremost, Taiwan needs to do more, to be perfectly blunt. And uh, Taiwan needs to take the steps that a country would take if it's facing an existential threat, because it is facing an existential threat. And I mean, the, the reality is that President Tsai has done some things and deserves credit for that. She has increased uh, the defense budget, but it's still not enough, quite frankly. And it's not just a question of of uh, how much is enough, but it's a, also a question of what do they, the Taiwanese spend um, their limited defense budget on? They need to focus on asymmetric means to deter and, if need be, derail a Chinese invasion. Uh, and uh, that uh, are things, you know, basically lots of little things that are resilient, and that will make it very difficult for PLA planners uh, to uh, get the force correlation right. So uh, you know, one of the things that we were able to, uh, to make headway on was a U.S. sale of coastal defense cruise missiles, for instance. But there's also the, uh, the Taiwan should invest in things like sea mines, um, drones, you name it. Part of the challenge, though, is that right now, um, you know, we're in essence, the only defense provider to Taiwan. Uh, one of the things that I think is in everyone's interest would be for the individual European uh, countries to look at their own domestic policies, in some cases, actually domestic law that precludes the export of defense articles to Taiwan. I think that that is something that should be looked at and quite frankly needs to be reformed because I think that will help as well. Additionally, Again, I think it's very important for not just uh, Asian neighbors of Taiwan, but also European like-minded countries to have an, a better assessment of the operational environment that Taiwan presents. And I think that would speak in favor of assigning uh, military officers unofficially, just like the United States assigns unofficial representatives to Taiwan. Uh, I think that would be helpful and could also serve for the basis of regular information and perhaps intelligence exchanges. Coast Guard cooperation between uh, Taiwan, the United States and other countries, whether it's in the waters in and around Taiwan or perhaps in, with the Pacific Island countries working on things together, having to do with climate change and the like. And then I think it would also be valuable kind of along uh, Todd's point, contingency planning, training and exercises that we can focus on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief scenarios in Taiwan, because the reality is that those types of engagements will also build um, the foundation for interoperability in other areas. And then capabilities and integration in terms of communications and ISR, building resiliency and interoperability, and perhaps even developing you know, common operating picture. And then overarchingly, I would say multilateralizing the risk because there is safety in numbers, quite frankly. I think AUKUS and Quad are perfect examples of that. And, you know, um, to, to your point about putting, you know, routinely or DeSera's point of putting routinely a European ship 
in the Taiwan Strait. You know, I think that would be phenomenal, quite frankly. And I wish, I don't know if it's too late now, Sarah, but I wish, you know, the, the Bayan on its way home to Wilhelmshaven would go through the Taiwan Strait. You know, um, so I think there are things that can be done that signal China that this is not just a China Taiwan issue or a China US issue. There are many others that are against a unilateral Chinese solution to the cross strait dilemma. So I'll leave it at that. Um, yes, I fully agree. And uh, about the Bayern, uh, one should keep in mind that this is the very first thing that Germany has, has been doing since, I think, 20 years now. Um, I have heard informally that it might not be the last thing that Germany might be doing. And one can infer from the rather, you know, miffed reaction coming from China to this transit, because the Bayern actually offered uh, to go on a port visit to Shanghai. And uh, China denied the Bayern this port visit. So this is a signal that China has interpreted this as a, like a hostile action or an unfriendly action. And that's more than I, I frankly think is warranted given that the Bayern is transiting basically only that area and um, only doing very you know, diplomatic things out there. And it's just a, a single ship, of course. Uh, I would add to what uh, Heino Klink just mentioned in terms of the military capabilities that would be helpful. Uh, the submarine uh, dimension is very important. That's why AUKUS is also so fundamentally important, because ultimately submarines are perhaps a very decisive type of system that could, in a contingency, really make the difference. And we know all that the um, United States, is due to past procurement decisions and delays, is facing uh, uh, yeah, well, if a period where fewer submarines are going to be available than in the past, and at the same time, China is, is, is massively enhancing its own submarine capabilities and also enhancing it, 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 its ASW, its submarine hunting abilities, particularly in the South China Sea, but also in, in other areas with this Blue Ocean Information Network and so on. So if we even think hypothetically about coordinated actions between China and Russia. They do not even have to be, you know, in the same theater. They could just be coordinated on a timeline for Russia to, to do something troublesome in Europe, right, <laughs> like just now, and then a Taiwan uh, escalation. This could very easily become a, a situation where everyone uh, feels overstretched. And so I think the most important contribution that Europeans can actually maybe uh, contribute is um, enhancing the security of Europe itself to, to freeing American resources to some degree and also to make it less attractive for Putin and Xi to try and go for this, you know, double trouble scenario. That would already be a contribution that I think would be valuable. But I do think you're completely right, of course, pointing out the allowing Taiwan the ability to defend itself depends, of course, on, on the exports of arms. And we do have something like an almost de facto arms embargo against Taiwan due to our interpretation of the one China policy. But it wasn't always like that. In the past, we have seen submarine sales, fighter aircraft were sold from, from France, also frigates. And uh, this is something that stopped at some point because of fear of upsetting China. But uh, we've also seen, on the other hand, attempts, for instance, from Britain to help Taiwan develop some technology. So they have been getting some help from different quarters. And that could be perhaps be more, you know, supported, supporting each other also in going down that road. I completely agree that this would be necessary. And one could frame it that way and communicate to China. It's your doing that we're seeing the necessity to do that. You have nobody else to thank for that than your belligerence. Because let's keep it straight. It's it's one party in this whole situation that's trying to change the long-standing status quo. It's not Taiwan, contrary to what China is trying to, to uh, tell people. And this should be always given as the reason for all these measures that we are taking supporting um, Taiwan, that this wasn't necessary in the past, but is necessary now because of the Chinese behavior. And one could also frame it positively in the way, say, 
if you go back to behaving rationally and reasonably, then things will become better for everyone. So friend is in a, in a way to point out a positive way of development. So conflict is, is of course not inevitable, not in anyone's interest, but uh, we must, and one last remark, we have not talked at all about NATO so far. And of course, NATO is a transatlantic organization and not uh, an Asian organization. But one should keep in mind, NATO represents more than 50% of the world's economy and also of the world's military capability. And so if NATO, in a purely defensive way of framing it, would say we stand with all our allies wherever their interests are threatened, that in itself might already also have quite you know, a subtle deterrent effect on China, knowing they might be faced in if worst comes to worst, not just with the United States, but with the whole of NATO. It's, I'm not sure whether NATO would be willing to, to make such a public you know, uh, claim. And I've heard a NATO official recently say, the less there is talk about Article 5, the better for Article 5. And maybe that is true. <laughs> so maybe one should not put the worst case scenario out there and bury that what you said, uh, defining red lines and naming the consequences for transgressing them has a drawback because it can make it attractive to try and you know, push the envelope and see whether that is a paper tiger or a real commitment. And there's the risk that it could turn out to be a paper tiger. So maybe better not go there. But I would say NATO could find ways to subtly communicating that this is the understanding. And I think that could also help. Um, Thank you, Sarah. Todd? Very quickly, because I know we're, we're running a bit late on time. Two kind of disparate thoughts. First, I want to go to your point about the Chinese hypersonic uh, missile test. I, China has long held a policy of no first use, meaning it would not be the first to use nuclear weapons. Um, my own view is it always had a policy of minimal deterrent, that it maintained just enough nuclear weapons to survive attack, that it could impose cost on an adversary. Um, Going to the hypersonic issue is, is a significant security um, part of the equation. It is upsetting the, um, the relationship that appears to be China developing capacity for a first strike capability, which is profoundly different from its minimal deterrent policy it's had. Um, so I know that's not this discussion today, but I think it, it is a element of conversation about China's perception of self and what China's aspirations are and what capabilities it believes it needs to check others, meaning the United States in particular, from acting. So there is a relationship to Taiwan here, um, in, you know, to your to your point. But I, I do find that's a profound change in the, in the strategic calculus between our countries. Second point unrelated to this, this one I just made. Um, I think we all learned a lesson or, or hopefully have absorbed what happened with Australia in terms of engagement with China, where it became enveloped in many ways um, and ended up having lots of problems, for example, on university campuses with intimidation by Chinese students, by the Confucius Institutes, that were really, they were starting to sponsor politicians, et cetera. Um, and so I don't know how China, the mainland has a, is sort of taking that lesson from the change that Sarah mentioned Australia has made. In Europe, you know, the, uh, from my perspective, the more nations that do say no to Huawei, um, and no to Confucius Institutes because they are an arm of the, a propaganda arm of the state. It is more effective in terms of recalibrating the influence. I don't think China can compete at all in soft power diplomacy. And I think we're seeing that it fails on that. Um, it certainly is able to compete in terms of mercantilism. Um, but on the soft power side, I do think we, you know, the, the democratic nations have a bit of a responsibility to play to um to push back on on manipulative soft power attempts from the prc so those are just two quick thoughts to this conversation great thank you todd and i encourage uh, anyone in the audience to submit a, a question if they would like it uh, addressed by any of the panelists um in the meantime let me just uh, keep keep this conversation going todd and um we do have a national defense strategy coming out at some point in the next uh, two to three months 
Um, and then, uh, so I want to talk to you about that a little bit, Todd. And then Sarah, we, we have a, a European Union compass. I guess that's a kind of strategy. Also has some magnetism in it um, and direction. Uh, we have a NATO strategic concept, which you also articulated uh, quite well. And then we have, a, I think, a, a U.S. interagency. I saw a press report, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy coming out. So we have a strategic kind of uh, uh, confluence here that provides enormous opportunities for Europe uh, and the United States to, to weigh in in ways, uh, develop capabilities and send messages that could be helpful for deterring attack on Taiwan. Uh, but Todd, starting with you and defense, uh, you once um, said it would be appropriate for the U.S. to send more military force to the Indo-Pacific from a signaling and deterrent standpoint in response to China's increased military operations. Uh, could, could you elaborate on this a little bit? And there's a global posture review. Do you see that as helping for strengthening um, U.S. Uh, forces and capabilities in the Indo-Pacific or that can be brought to bear? in the Indo-Pacific to help deter uh, Chinese attack on Taiwan? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. I, I think it is a piece in it in terms of increasing our actual presence in Indo-Pacific theater. But I always um, have fundamentally believed that there's two swing states in the region that matter greatly to influencing how China reacts to the US presence. And that is South Korea and the Philippines. Um, and for South Korea, it's involved in terms of its relationship with Japan and how strong those two states would stand together vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, with us vis-a-vis -vis mainland. Um, the Philippines, we've seen a lot of vacillation. They have a national election coming up. Um, and hopefully the election will turn out in a way from certainly a U.S. perspective that there's reinforcing the concept of this partnership with the Philippines. So from a security equation, it is actually, to me, less about the hardware than the security partnerships, the ones that have just been nurturing the Quad, AUKUS, et cetera. But again, getting the Philippines a little bit tighter back in the fold and continuing our multi-decade effort to increase the partnership between uh, Republic of Korea and Japan in terms of comfort level of, uh, of viewing China um, from the same prism at which we, we view it. And I think, you know, the, the, um, our, our national defense strategy is expectedly going to kind of call for more of that as well. Thank you, So Todd. with respect, if yeah, I may, you. on the global force posture review, um, you know, what's important to note is a quite obvious fact that our allies and partners do get a vote on this. And uh, with respect to Japan, any change to the U.S. force posture in Japan is a very, very sensitive political issue. Uh, and I think there's a way to address that. And I'm hoping that uh, the Biden administration is at the highest levels engaging um, Prime Minister Kishida and, and his team on what is needed, because I think changes to the U.S. force posture are required in Japan. And it might not necessarily be a net increase or a large increase in U.S. forces, but a change in the type of forces. For instance, the U.S. Marine Corps has this new uh, 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 unit uh, called the Marine Littoral Regiment that has surface-to-surface -surface missiles, for instance. But on the point of South Korea, I think a point that needs to be made is that, you know, we maintain 28,500 troops in South Korea. Uh, and from a South Korean perspective, they have only one mission, which is to deter the DPRK. And, uh, and if deterrence fails to fight the North Korean military, I would say that that's a luxury that cannot be sustained. And by that, I mean, not that we pull forces from the Korean Peninsula, but we make it clear that those forces need to have some sort of strategic flexibility, meaning just like we pulled forces from the peninsula to fight in the Middle East, that they, we have, we include those forces in our own contingency and operational planning that if needed elsewhere in the Western Pacific, we can pull them from South Korea. That again, will have a certain amount of political baggage associated with it. But that being said, addressing these things 
early on and forthright and frankly in a non-public manner with the blue house will be important and i think even you know depending on how the elections work out uh next spring in south korea um you know there might be uh, if there is a change in parties in charge in seoul um we may be able to have a productive and if you will adult conversation about this because i don't think we can uh, maintain that level of uh, commitment uh, in a country, regardless of the country, with only one mission. Thank you, Heino. And Sarah, what about the, the EU and uh, its evolving position, uh, including the compass? Well, I would say more important than what's in those documents is the fact that they exist in the first place. It's a little bit like the transit of the frigate Bayern. More important than the, the facts of that transit is that it, it has happened at all. You know, it wasn't called off. It wasn't sort of derailed. And if you look at, at Europe and also Germany in, in particular, in my case, uh, over the past couple of years, the change in perception that has happened is actually incredible. It's, it's not enough. We, we are only like waking up to the reality of how bad things really are already and how bad they could get. But a couple of years ago, you found almost as a mainstream opinion that there's nothing going on there and Taiwan is, is safe and there's nothing to worry about. And Europe is an economic actor, but doesn't need any sort of strategic outlook and so on. And, and that was basically the mainstream view. So Europe was always very good at insulating itself from really looking at even its, its near abroad and not, of course, looking strategically in that sense at any region. And also being very you know, confident in the United States military support. And I think it has taken some time to sink for the reality to sink in that some things can't be taken for granted and that other regions of the world are developing so fast in a, in a worrisome direction. And now suddenly Europe has all these crises erupting uh, in Europe itself, like we're just now seeing on the border between Poland and, and Belarus, for instance. Um, it's been a rude awakening, you can tell that, and it takes some time for, for people to rearrange their worldview and getting round to, you know, ditching some concepts that no longer work, so it would be unrealistic for this to happen within six months or something, but I must say I used to be pretty pet pessimistic about Europe's, and in particular Germany's, ability to meet the challenge a couple of years ago, but I'm no longer that pessimistic seeing how fast we have in some ways adapted, in particular, our outgoing defense minister, Annegret kram karrenbauer She has really done some, some bold things, I would say, and, and has, has earned the respect of the troops, I would say. So I've, I've, I haven't heard a single soldier complain about her, and that's, that's rare in German defense ministers. So uh, she has really done some things that I would never have expected to see from a German defense minister anytime soon. And that's, in my view, um, showing that it's not really about what exact wording we put into these documents. The fact that a process has begun where people try to think strategically and, and do the first steps into, into that direction, that is already something. And of course, this needs to become better and must be more integrated with NATO and with the allies. I think key here really is, and that's something I tell all the people I, I get a chance to, to uh, advise, interact and consult with the Asian allies of the United States and with Australia because these people are on the front line. They know exactly what's going on there, but they are not the United States. They have their own national perceptions and interacting with them and asking their you know, opinions about stuff. That's really what's going to change the minds of our decision makers, in my view. Thank you, Sarah. And I, uh, I think we are out of time. Unfortunately, we have covered a ton of ground. I wanna thank all three of our panelists for offering very specific and actionable recommendations across a wide range of allies and um, actions and um, other relevant domains. So thank you so much. Um, I've learned a lot, um, really engaging conversation and please stay tuned everyone as we'll continue to do programming on this really important set of questions associated with deterrence of Chinese attack on Taiwan and the broader
management of the China challenge. So thank you everyone for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon.